Hello everyone. In this video lecture, we'll begin reviewing material for week four of Trends in Career Development. There will be two parts to this video lecture. This is part one. This week, you'll continue looking at different perspectives on work and how it has been influenced by post-industrial society, particularly the impact of globalization on the labor market. We'll look at historical forces shaping globalization and also current forces, including the pandemic. Material presented in this week's lecture are taken from three sources, Chapter 2 of the textbook, the Future Work 2.0 video, and the articles on the pandemic. The video and articles are posted under Week 4 on Blackboard. It would be a good idea to have read the chapter from the textbook and the articles and to view the video before you watch the lecture videos for this week. We've talked in previous weeks about the evolution of society through the pre-modern, modern, industrial, and postmodern, post-industrial ages. This week, we'll revisit some of these historical influences on the global economy and labor market, as many of the trends we're examining in this course are a direct result of these historical influences and continue to have an impact on the labor market today. As career development practitioners, we're not expected to be global economists. Economics is a complex, dynamic, and rapidly changing force in the labor market. It's impossible to be fully up to date unless that is your full-time occupation. And even those who are professional economists struggle to fully integrate global changes as they can happen so quickly, this pandemic being one example of that. However, you do need a basic understanding of global trends affecting the national economy at the macro level. It's important to find sources of reliable and current information to monitor. So it's important that you understand these trends as part of the macro view of the labor market and also understand the impact these trends have on clients at the micro level. Developing and understanding global economic forces will help you in working with clients at the mezzo and micro level. Essentially, you need to understand the big picture and do your best to interpret it for your clients when they're making career decisions and seeking work. There are, of course, global differences in the types of work that are available and the availability of that work. These can be affected by a wide range of factors, such as geography, economic infrastructure of different countries, cost of goods and services, demographics of the population, even the weather. A national disaster in any country can affect the economy in that country at both the local and national level, and then also have repercussions for other countries. Changes of any type overseas and around the world can result in significant changes at the national and provincial level in our own country. Changes are driven by a number of forces, things like new technologies, types of work, politics affecting free trade, globalization, and deregulation of labor markets. And these are just a few examples of the forces that can affect the economy. Of course, the global economy is currently in flux and very unstable due to the pandemic. This is likely to continue for some time, possibly even years. Things are changing rapidly, sometimes within just a few weeks. Sudden developments can be game changers. So as one example, the anticipated release of a vaccine will have a tremendous impact on businesses being able to return to some level of quote unquote normal. However, some businesses have already not survived the pandemic and there will likely be others that go out of business in the coming months. You do need to do the best you can, uh, both as a worker yourself and then in working with your own clients, need to do the best you can to be informed about the forces that are affecting uh, the labor market. And this will allow you to help clients make sense of the changes and trends that are happening and make informed career and job decisions. One thing I want to emphasize here is that it is very important to try and project a sense of hope and a way forward for clients. And we'll come back to this idea later in this lecture. Just returning momentarily to the historical influences on the economy, Canada, as I said in previous lectures, was a late industrializer. They were late coming to the game and followed in the footsteps of the United States. Uh, but Canada did have a strong resource and manufacturing based economy established by the early 20th century. The period following World War II in particular was a time of significant optimism and economic growth in North America. And it made sense that this was the case as people were war weary and eager to see the war come to an end in the hopes that this would boost the economy. 
It's important to understand that there have always been cycles between uh, the economy and prosperity growth and recession or depression. So uh, when you live long enough and you work long enough, you begin to recognize that there are these cyclical ups and downs that happen in our economy. And the idea is that, you know, what goes down must eventually come up and what goes up eventually does go down. So you need to be informed about the cycles in our economy and where we're at uh, at any given time so that you can be better informed to work with your clients. Uh, so in mentioning the idea of recession and depression, you may be wondering, you know, what's the difference between those in particular? So a recession tends to be viewed as more of a temporary decline in economic activity that may last for a few months or possibly even a year or so, but it is seen as more of a temporary condition. Uh, and most uh, economists right now would probably say that we are in a recession due to the pandemic. We don't know how that's going to turn out down the road. So for the time being, we're not calling this a depression. We're calling it a recession. A depression is more extreme. Uh, it can last for years. For example, the Great Depression lasted from 1929 to 1939. So a depression is much longer lasting and uh, takes longer for a country to uh, emerge from. And of course, a recession then can turn into a depression. But there is no clearly defined benchmark for when one turns into the other. So uh, you may see these terms sometimes being used interchangeably, depression versus recession. The bottom line is these are times of economic downturn that we need to be aware of. So there are five factors that are influencing the Canadian economy, both in the past and present. The first four on this list are covered in the textbook. And then the fifth one, of course, is the pandemic. So these five factors are the managerial revolution, post-industrialization, industrial restructuring, globalization, and the pandemic. So let's have a look first at the idea of the managerial revolution. And this was based on the idea that managers and not owners in businesses would begin looking beyond the idea of profit and loss when making decisions so that it was, wouldn't be all about money and that they would consider the good of a company and the workers to be equally important and that the idea behind the managerial revolutionary theory is that the power and control of an enterprise would be held by a new class of professional managers who would be able to strike this balance between the good of the company and the good of the workers. It's generally agreed today that this perspective was overly optimistic and that this development, the uh, inclusion of more professional managers within an organization has not changed the imbalance in power between owners, managers, and employees. In the past, decades ago, uh, many organizations were run much like families and owned by a, a group of, of individuals who were part of the same family. So when that was the case, when that was one of the common things you would encounter in an organization, and I can remember myself early in my career working for companies where it did feel like it was a family, that the owners did care about the individual members of the organization. Sometimes people would even refer to their company as being like a family. So although family ownership patterns may be less common today, they have not completely disappeared, but certainly are much harder to find. Many corporations are still controlled by small groups of minority shareholders. And in addition, another a post-war trend has been corporate ownership of shares. And most often these uh, shares are held by people who are already wealthy and in positions of power. So it really has entrenched that sense that there is a, a group of people who do tend to hold on to most of the wealth and most of the power in large organizations and even in small ones. So the belief that the relatively small, powerful capitalist class described by Marx, uh, the belief that that has virtually disappeared is not supported by the evidence. And in fact, research shows that senior managers and corporate executives tend to think and act in much the same way as the capitalist owners. So this means that this power imbalance remains. 
those who have the power in organizations seem to be increasingly focused on profit and loss and the bottom line. And there's much less attention uh, being paid to the needs of employees uh, in even providing things like full-time work and uh, a reasonable salary and benefits. All of these things seem to be harder to find and seem to be decreasing. And we will explore these ideas more in week seven when we look at the gig economy and precarious employment. So the growth of a global man managerial class seems to be supporting uh, the interests of the wealthy elites. And a simpler way to say that is that the rich continue to get richer and the poor do seem to be getting poorer. We talked in previous weeks in this course about the idea that economies were uh, around the turn of the 18th to 19th century were um, largely agriculture based and um, the industrial revolution meant that jobs in manufacturing and processing sectors replaced jobs in agriculture. So the latter half of the 20th century saw the economy move from the industrial era to the post-industrial society. After World War II, jobs in the service sector became more prominent. So factory work decreased, employment in education, health, uh, social welfare, finance, and other sectors increased. And white collar workers began to outnumber blue collar workers and we began to see more opportunity for people to move into these types of jobs. We are now in what's considered a post-industrial society or the knowledge age, uh, the age of artificial intelligence, the technological era. There's lots of different ways to view this era, but one of the primary factors that uh, identify it is a shift in work from goods and manufacturing to production and dissemination of knowledge and services. As we saw previously over a hundred years ago, the vast majority of people would be farming their own farms, uh, crafting products to sell with their own hands. And now we see that uh, there's been a shift from goods and manufacturing and agriculture to production and dissemination of knowledge and services over the past 100 years. So this term knowledge workers, this is the idea that uh, workers are, uh, they've emerged as an important class of workers, that they there is more emphasis in the work being done today on handling and producing information rather than a tangible good. So uh, emphasis on handling, using and disseminating information. So when we think about knowledge workers, career development practitioners are knowledge workers. You are bringing knowledge about the labor market, how to look for work, uh, and all of that that entails. You're bringing that knowledge to your work with your clients. So you will be considered, and you are considered, a knowledge worker. The author Richard Florida uh, says that the emerging creative class accounts for roughly one third of workers today. So when he refers to this creative class, he means people using knowledge and information to produce works or work or services that are creative in some way. So you have to take the knowledge that you have and apply it in different ways to different situations. So again, think about yourself working as a career development practitioner. You're going to have a very broad range of different types of clients with all sorts of issues. And you're being given in our program a foundation of knowledge about making career choices and seeking work and all of that. Uh, but you're going to bring that knowledge and apply that knowledge and those processes in different ways with different clients. So you're having to be creative in the work that you do. Richard Florida says that there is a super creative core of scientists, engineers, professors, novelists, entertainers, etc., that have emerged over these uh, over the past few decades as we have moved into this information age. And he also identifies that there is a second layer of creative professionals working in fields like business, finance, and law. And, you know, we're using the word creative in a slightly different sense here. You might think about, you know, it says here law. So how would a lawyer be creative? We don't normally, you know, if we think about a creative occupation, we think about arts and music and that sort of thing. So how would somebody working in a legal 
job as a lawyer, how would that person be creative? Well, again, they have a foundation of knowledge that they have gathered by getting the proper education and experience, but each and every client that comes to see them is going to have uh, different needs, different issues, and you need to be able to take that information and apply it to each person individually. Think about it creatively. Think about how I'm going to use this information in a different way to meet the needs of this particular client. So again, these are all considered by Richard Flohr to, to be uh, creative occupations and that this has created an emerging creative class. Florida also sees a growing divide between creative workers and service class workers who provide cleaning, child care, and other services for the creative class. Many jobs in the service class are part of what's called the gig economy. Again, we'll be looking at that in more detail in week seven. Um, but these types of jobs tend to be less secure, tend to be more contract work rather than permanent jobs, tend to have lower pay, tend to have few protections and benefits. So again, referred to as precarious employment. And again, we will look at these concepts more uh, in the coming weeks. What's interesting is that because of the pandemic, many of these services suddenly became essential services. And there was a great outpouring of uh, appreciation and a greater understanding through this pandemic of how much we rely in our society on these essential services. We cannot function without them. If there were nobody staffing the grocery stores, we wouldn't be able to get our food. So um, as a result of the pandemic, at least in Ontario, and I believe across Canada, temporary salary increases were given to some essential workers during the pandemic. And many people are calling for this to be a, a permanent arrangement. So many workers within this, these sectors uh, barely receive a survival, survivable wage. Uh, and, and sometimes have to survive for years on minimum wage jobs, which is just not feasible in our economy. So, um, it, you know, there was, this is a good outcome of the pandemic, that more attention is being given to this issue, but of course it remains to be seen how this will play out in the future. Robert Reich, who was the Secretary of Labor in the United States in the 1990s, says that the knowledge economy offers great opportunities for well-educated and creative workers. But he also acknowledges that job quality has eroded sharply through declining pay and job security, as I just mentioned, coupled with increased demands for continued effort. So at the same time as individuals are being relegated sometimes for many years in low paying precarious jobs, at the same time, companies seem to be demanding uh, more loyalty, more effort, expecting people to be available almost 24 seven. So uh, there's been again, a, a real imbalance in the uh, opportunities that are made available to people on one side of this uh, digital divide versus um, people on the other side of it in the post-industrial age. Trends such as automation of work, reduced economic security, widening labor market polarization in the service versus the creative class have all become more pronounced since the 1990s. And just a couple more points I want to cover before we finish this uh, short video off. So uh, there's also this reference in the textbook to the new digital economy. This refers to industri industries based on new information and communication technology such as artificial intelligence. So again, we have this huge gap between um, people who are relegated to low paid types of jobs and those who are able to explore and be eligible for the jobs that are generated by this knowledge-based economy. And uh, we really have a fully networked society at this point, which is the new technical uh, economic model. And we can think of this networking as social networking. So for example, social media such as LinkedIn allows you to network with people all around the world. We can also think of this as technical networking. So information is being transmitted instantaneously around the world. And this can have immediate impacts on both the global and national and local economies. So there continues to be a growing digital divide based on social groups. Uh, communities, and even countries that are included or excluded from this economy. 
there there are shockingly places, many places in Ontario where communities do not have internet access uh, or, and do not even have, and this is separate from the digital divide, but do not even have access to clean running water. Um, so that, that really, you know, boggles our mind in terms of seeing the differences between uh, people who are on one side of this digital divide versus people who are on the other side uh, and continue to see the ways in which those inequities play themselves out and impact uh, certain groups and certain sectors in our demographics. So this is the end of part one of our video lecture for this week. And I will pause, uh, stop the video here and I'll create a second one for part two. So please go on to that second video when you are ready to have a look at it.